All right, thank you guys for being here. I'm glad I'm not the talk of the day. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Jim, for the great introduction. Thank you, sponsors, for making this happen and for the daycare especially. <laughs> so let's, there we go. All right, so thank you for the introduction. Kind of a couple more words. Um, so I'm originally from Siberia. Uh, I now live in Washington, D.C., but Siberian in my heart. Um, I've been doing application security for eight years now, and before I was a developer writing code in ActionScript, if anybody remembers what that was, <laughs> in, the wor in the world of Flash. So I guess I keep up with the script-type languages. But, um, and now I'm also working on my PhD, of course, about security and JavaScript and frameworks. And I do have a professional Twitter account. Don't mess confuse my last names, Figuero Dmitrieva, <laughs> originally. And I also um, now became a mother of a nine months old girl who is here. Um, so that's awesome that I'm still able to work and travel. So security is important. And yes, in my kind of wishful world, I'm a ballroom dancer. That's what I would do if that made as much money as security, but you know. <laughs> So, um, today we're going to talk about JavaScript one more time. Who here has written JavaScript? Who, who does it? Like, all right, awesome, yeah. Um, and then who has written in React? Oh, wow, thank you. That's, that's pretty awesome, cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about the state of JavaScript security and specifically um, common vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities in the frameworks or kind of how the use of the frameworks change what we do in JavaScript, and then we'll switch to React and look at a couple uh, problems with the framework, a couple vulnerabilities, things, the mistakes that developers make with it, and yeah, I'll have some demos that will hopefully work. So um, JavaScript, you know, to kind of re-quote, <laughs> one of the things I saw on Twitter is that JavaScript is a great language, but sometimes it makes me say, screw this shit, except I don't know what this means in this context. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what is the state of JavaScript security today, or JavaScript field today? And yeah, they're like, there are more frameworks there, there are applications. And note that this quote was in 2012, and we're in 2018, and there are even more frameworks, and what do we do with that? Well, yeah, I don't know, because in 2004, this is how we wrote code, right? And today, well, this is 2014, right? This is what happens. So while I'm enjoying here in Hawaii, you know, a couple weeks, I come back, and I don't know what's gonna be the next JavaScript framework. Probably everything is gonna be outdated by then. So, so what about the frameworks? Um, the good, yes, they allow us to develop everything better, faster, because you just run, you know, you have your boilerplate and you run two lines of code and you run your React script start and everything magically works and you don't know where it's deployed and how, but it, it works, right? Um, from the security reviewer perspective, it's much easier to review the code if you know the uh, if you're familiar with the idioms, right, if you know what you're reviewing, which has a pretty high learning curve. Um, the applications are safer if their framework is safer, right? So kind of you will basically offload this uh, responsibility to the framework somewhat. The bad, well, yeah, as I said, steep learning curve. Um, the bugs are sometimes harder to find if you don't know what you're looking for, or they're hidden in the hundreds of dependencies that you load from NPM, and then you have all the bugs in your applications. Um, the frameworks are open source, you know, highly extendable, and there are tons of plugins and tons of third-party libraries. So when you, again, when you pull all of that in, what's the quality of the third-party code? Not always as good as the quality of the framework itself, right? So those are the risks that you're facing. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes you don't get good documentation, you have to get into the source code and find how things are actually working, et cetera, et cetera. But 
the reality, can, what can we do? We cannot stop using the frameworks. Come on, right? They're there, they're there to stay. Nobody's gonna write vanilla JavaScript code, not any, or TypeScript code, right, not anymore. So, of course we have the client-side JavaScript and the server-side JavaScript, kind of quick overview here. If we're looking at the security issues for the client side, of course, yes, process scripting, number one, still there, the DOM kind especially. Um, if the framework has expression language, and like Angular and Vue do have expression languages, you have the new expression language, uh, expression language injections, right, which usually end up in a process scripting as well. Uh, we have, you know, of course, click jacking, and now we can do a CSV click jacking where you don't even need to use any JavaScript, right, you just, add an element with your CS, like a CSV button on top of some element and you collect the clicks and do whatever you want, can change the UI. There is DOM clobbering, that's uh, not something new that's been around for more than 10 years, or eight years, um, where, so the DOM is super, super messy. And if you have one element with an ID and then you add and inject another element with the same ID, now, you get a collection of IDs. That's how browser interprets them. And of course, the properties now change. You cannot access the methods of the original item. And yeah, you can do pretty bad stuff with that. Client-side trust issues. So with the JavaScript frameworks being so heavy on the client side, you move so much logic, business logic, onto the client side. And sometimes you may be trusting the client too much having too much data or having your authentication authorization for some reason on the client. I mean, that, that's so widespread. Um, CSRF, of course, that's a server-side vulnerability, but we have the features in some frameworks that sometimes help you protect from it. So there is like the, that client element where you have to take the token and plug it, put it either in the you know, post um, parameter or the HTTP header. And some, some frameworks do it automatically for you, like Angular does. Some don't, and then you have to use some third-party library or implement it yourself or use JWTs, and we'll talk about <laughs> that later. Uh, and then, of course, there's information leakage. Again, trust of the client. You're loading too much data. You're putting it on you know, local storage or something like that. So server-side vulnerabilities are not as exciting because pretty much, you know, server-side JavaScript node and all the frameworks that come with it are the vulnerabilities are the same as any other server-side language. You have your injections, a ton of them. Uh, you have, of course, if you're using NoSQL database, you have the NoSQL injections that are different from the SQL injections. CSERF, the server-side part of it, the validation of the token. Uh, remote code executions with JavaScript are fun because we have the eval, right? And then, you know, Alpha and Alpha Z, the deserialization, the new thing in the OWASP top 10, the, which is quite common in JavaScript because we have eval, and again, we'll, we'll see some examples of that, and all this stuff. So this is not the focus of today's talk, right? So we're gonna concentrate on the client side. And if we look at the newest OWASP top 10, which of the things apply to JavaScript, to the client side JavaScript? Right? Let's see, injections, of course, we have expression injection. You know, not SQL, not LDAP or command, but we have expression injection. Uh, broken authentication, yes, if you do it on the client side. Um, sensitive data exposure, yes, if you're trusting the client. XML entities injection, probably not. I mean, most of the JavaScript frameworks you are using, JSON, and then even if you are using XML, you're not using the same um, parsers on the client side. So at least here we can have a break. Uh, access control. Yes, if you implement it on the client side, wrong. You will have problems with that. Misconfiguration, if you're using a framework that has settings, security features, and you misconfigure it, that's a problem. Uh, XSS, of course. Insecure deserialization, yes. So again, um, it happens more often on the server side, but you may have it on, in your client side code as well, and we'll, we'll see some examples. Components with known vulnerabilities, course, if we're pulling everything from the NPM and all the, you know, tons of vulnerabilities, uh, tons of open source projects, I should say, you know, of course, you're, you're pulling that into your uh, environment as well. And insufficient logging or monitoring, eh, I mean, on client side, not so much, but you have, if you use like an analytics website, right, you're sending your stats somewhere, that's where your logging and monitoring may come into play, or CSP, and you're like, report the, um, the bypasses. Right? 
So what do frameworks give us in terms of security? So they have pros and cons. They have you know, the good things. They may have security controls built in. For example, uh, a lot of them, JavaScript, will have contextual escode, uh, encoding, escaping, whatever you call it, right? Like Angular, like Vue, like all the templating engines will do contextually aware encoding, knowing where you're outputting your user data. Is the URL parameter, is it HTML entity, an HTML attribute, kind of, we're good here. CSRF protection, as I said, for example, Angular, if you have, if you set your HD, uh, cookie, uh, XSS cookie, oh, I'm sorry, CSRF cookie name in a way that Angular you know, is expecting, it will take that cookie and add an HTTP header and then you again read that HTTP header from the service side as long as the names match and you can configure it either on your service side or on the client side, right? So that's taken care of for you. Uh, type checking, some frameworks add a feature that you would actually use types in JavaScript, the wonderfully loosely typed type language. Uh, like React has the type props library that will allow you to actually set the types or if you're using Angular 2 and up, you're using TypeScript, kind of even better. Sandbox, which is not a security, uh, <laughs> here I'm, I'm referring to the Angular sandbox, which is not a security feature. That was, you know, there are tons of sandbox bypasses, et cetera, et cetera. But some frameworks kind of try to um, protect you from the bad stuff that XSS can do. Um, successfully or not, not sure. And then whitelist, some, again, some frameworks will have features, for, for, example, for example, Angular will have a feature where you can configure where you can load your resources from. You can whitelist you know, a list of domains. And so these are just some examples of the security controls that are built into the framework, helping you, us to write better code. But there are also some insecurities that come with the use of frameworks. Expression injection, if you have an expression language in the framework, right? you can have a new type of injection there. Uh, sandbox can be bypassed. Insecure APIs, so sometimes a framework will have a dangerous API that shouldn't be used, like trust as or dangerously set in our HTML in React, but you know, they're there, or, well, eval is not a framework API, but things like that, right? So they, they exist, and those are, would be the things that we look for as security you know, code reviewers. And uh, CSP bypasses. Again, you may use the framework that compliant with the CSP, and you may st have strong CSP policy and not have any inline script, et cetera, but some of the frameworks actually, you can bypass CSP and inject a script, well, not a script, you inject kind of a framework element that's then interpreted by the framework code and then result in a script injection. Like jQuery has that, Ember had some, Angular obviously had CSP bypasses. So you're bringing that into your application as well. So that's kind of the overview, and let's talk about React. As Jim said, you know, why we're talking about React? Well, that's kind of the hot framework today. If we look at the NPM stats for downloads, React is like way out there. Of course, Angular was pretty popular. Vue is catching up. Uh, it's still pretty low there but the, it's, actually, um, it's actually growing pretty, pretty fast. So for a year from now, it may be, you know, may bypass React or be somewhere kind of in the middle. So that's the other new stuff that's coming up. So React was introduced in 2013, a little bit of history here. What was, what kind of was the world, the view of JavaScript in 2013? Well, Angular JS was super popular. Everybody was writing in Angular. And React came out with a few features that Angular didn't have, or actually React said, well, the way you're doing this is wrong. We're gonna do it a different way. So one of them, the one big one was uh, one-way binding versus two-way binding, right? Angular said, had two-way binding where you update the model, the UI updates, you update the UI, the model updates. Great, but it was very hard to maintain and very hard to scale big applications, it became, it like just created a mess. So the React developer said, we're not gonna do that, it's just gonna be one way, the model updates the UI, that's it. They also introduced their own templating language, JSX, 
and decided not to have an expression language, but instead have the JSX involved in it. We'll look at that. And they also introduced a virtual DOM, which allows you to render React on the server side and then just you know, send the plain HTML that's gonna be displayed in the page right away. The other thing that made React so popular was that in 2014, the Angular team said we are gonna release Angular 2 and that's gonna be a totally breaking change and basically a new framework and everything you're writing right now in Angular 1 is not gonna be compatible and you have, will have to rewrite it again. All right, I mean, that's not like the first time we saw something like that in the field, but the Angular 2 took two more years before it was released, or I'm sorry, a year before it was released, but a year in JavaScript world is a long time, and because there was that um, insecure, well, I don't wanna use the word insecure, but like kinda unknown situation of what's gonna come out of Angular 2, a lot of developers actually switched to React because it was out, we knew what was going on there, what are the features, we, developers didn't wanna continue developing the applications in Angular 1 or starting developing in Angular 1 because Angular 2 was coming out. And that time frame actually allowed React to become super, super popular. And of course it's backed by Facebook, so you know, has good support and good documentation, surprisingly. Um, so the talk is kind of about JavaScript frameworks, but React is actually not a framework. <laughs> if we look at the documentation, it is a library. It is a user um, interfaces library. And I think that's just terminology, because realistically, if you ask, okay, what is your application written in? It's written in React, it's written in Angular, it's written in Vue. You can kind of use them interchangeably, so kind of as a framework. But the reason, kind of one of the reasons why it's not a framework, it doesn't have the full functionality that would allow us to call it a framework. So it's not opinionated in many things. For example, it doesn't have the routing built in, right? It doesn't have like CSRF protection. It doesn't have originally kind of like the state management, although everybody's using, well, not everybody, a lot of people are using Redux with React although you could use something else as well. Um, and because it doesn't have a lot of these core components built into the framework, it actually allowed um, to create, well, it kind of created a surface for a lot of plugins and libraries and have this vibrant community of third party developers building plugins and features for React. One thing that it is very opinionated in is the functional programming. It's not kind of fully functioning, functional programming, because it's not a language, right? But it has these concepts where everything is a function. So if we look at the uh, component, component is actually a function, so we pass some properties, which then become you know, the values of the attributes that we set on the HTML element, and here is our JSX that looks you know, kind of like HTML, but not really, that is later rendered into the actual HTML. So, let's start with process scripting. You know, we're, we're talking about client-side framework, of course, number one vulnerability will be process scripting. So, React has the contextually where escaping. Um, so, if you're trying to inject something that contains a script hey Birdie, excited by my talk, thank you. <laughs> you know, this, this is like in um, like third grade. You have a bird fly into the classroom and <laughs> completely disrupts the lesson. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, we're trying to inject some malicious input and we put it into our curly braces, it gets escaped, all good, because React actually does not use the inner HTML, doesn't change directly the inner HTML property, but what if we do need to change that? Of course there is a way, and we do that by using the, dangerous, the dangerously set inner HTML. And that's kind of another interesting thing that, you know, when, when Angular 1 is out, and they called that same, had the same functionality, and they called it trust as HTML or URL, et cetera. So I trust this code, where, where React said, no, 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 this is too, too not scary, 
because you're actually doing something super, super scary. So we're going to call it dangerously set in HTML. And then Angular 2 came out and said, oh, OK, OK, we're going to do that same thing. So we're going to say bypass security trust HTML. <laughs> that kind of makes me think about that first slide where, you know, how do we write JavaScript? Where are you? Your function names are like German words, <laughs> like four different things <laughs> but together. So React doesn't have expression, injection, uh, expression language, so it doesn't have expression injection, yay. But it creates components, and if we are creating components on the fly, dynamically, we may have component injection. So let's look at how the components are created. So we can write them in the JSX, where we create, have the tag, we have the attributes, the values of the attributes, our properties or props in um, React language. And then we have the content of you know, what's inside the tag, and that would be the children, the, the ch child property here. So that the JSX code gets transpiled into JavaScript, and when it gets transpiled, this is what we get, or we can actually write it like this, but nobody does it because this is ugly. So we have the first parameter, which is the type, h1. Uh, we have the second parameter, the properties that we're passing, for example, the class name here. And then we have the array of children. So in this case, we're passing just one text node, hello world. So these are the three points where we may be able to inject something if we're creating a component dynamically. So one, um, the first XSS that became uh, known in React was actually found on the HackerOne website itself. I think this is super cool. <laughs> uh, and that was the problem not in the HackerOne website, but in the React framework. So there it was possible to have an injection in the children property, right? So if we are sending some malicious JavaScript, uh, malicious input into the children, like their attack preload, you know, we just said this is going to be escape, right? If we, if we go back, we said, oh, Right, so we just said if we're trying to send some script, it's gonna be escape. So, hmm, what do we do here? Well, we're not sending JavaScript in there. What we're doing, we can send um, a JSON object, and apparently React, you know, now it's fixed, right? But before, it would not only accept a string, that would be normal, but it would actually accept a JSON object. And you could have a JSON object that you know, to, ma to make something a JSON object, you would just have an, you know, JSON, uh, well, a, J a React object, you would just have a JSON object with the is React element property that's set to true, and then a couple other properties that you have to have, like, you know, state and the type, and then you're sending your props, and here's your prop with the set dangerously HTML, which is actually um, accept accepting an object with the property underscore underscore HTML, and there is your payload. So that worked, and then was fixed in React 14. So after that, you cannot inject an object into the children. It has to be a string. So that's good. So to, uh, the children injection is fixed. Now we have two more properties here. We have the type, and this field is still injectable, but this is just the t HTML type of the element. So what can we do? You know, we cannot inject any attributes here. Okay, so you may inject another header, you may inject another div, you may inject, you know, kind of a break or image, but you cannot inject any properties. So it's pretty useless, right? You, you can't do anything about it. The good stuff is the props, which is still injectable. So if you are passing untrusted input into the props element, then you just set your property to dangerously set inner HTML and pass your input. And your input should be an object with an underscore, underscore, HTML attribute name, and then kind of your payload. So this is one sync, as you know, in our, like, the code review terminology, we say, that we're looking for. If we are creating the elements dynamically, this is one place where you definitely have to look for untrusted input. The other problem, the other XSS vector, are the injections into the attributes that allow JavaScript execution already. Uh, and most common of them are the, element, the attributes that accept 
URL, so URIs, because you can, of course, inject the JavaScript schema URI and inject your payload here. So it's not only the href tag that's kind of well known, but HTML5 also introduced a couple things like the form action for the button or the poster attribute for the, um, uh, the video and audio. Now it's fixed, but used to be a problem as well. So instead of the, the poster, the URL to an image, you could also inject the JavaScript URL. And, um, oh, also another HTML5, new, new HTML5 feature are the imports, the JavaScript imports, because in your uh, head, header, you could inject the imports links to the other JavaScript files that would be loaded into your page. And so if you create those dynamically, then, you know, if your user input goes into this href for the link element, then you can also execute JavaScript. How do we fix that? Well, you have to strip out the um, JavaScript schema, right? You can have, write a simple regex for that, or a better way to do it, just use a library that will you know, parse the URL and actually you can then verify what is the protocol of the URL that you are injecting. Right. And yes, I know these things make Jim very, very, very angry. Right, Jim? <laughs> All right, so let's look at some examples. <laughs> the moment of glory. <laughs> right? Okay. So here is a sample JavaScript applica uh, React application that we use in our ILT training. And if we create a new post with the name local mobile, and we specify the URL, right? Looks good. And then when we try to visit the link, you know, we have the pop-up injection, of course. So if we look at the source code, what's going on here is that we are creating you know, a new post and then we are sending that URL from the server side that you know, we, we didn't validate on the client side and we're creating a new component here with React and sending that URL property. And then if we look at the component itself, then we're creating an A um, uh, tag with an href that takes our URL, right? That's where injection happens. So we were setting the href to something that is not trusted, we don't have any validation, and that becomes a problem. Actually, this code has another vulnerability. So if we look at this A tag here, then, so we set the target, we set the href, we set the class name, and that's pretty much it, right? So, what, what else is wrong with this? With setting an A tag to an unknown URL. I'm sorry? Yeah. Right, so I, I talked about that. Like, that's, the, that's number one. What else? So, that untrusted URL, when a user clicks on it, uh, the browser will set a referrer header from your site that is gonna go to the third party site, right? And depending on what information you have in the refer header, you may be leaking some you know, pretty interesting stuff. So it's not kinda as bad, but yes, there, there's that as well. So let's go back to the slide. Um, so the next type of XSS, again, still an XSS subject, um, is the XSS with markdown. Well, you know, if we need to display some rich text with, you know, bold, italics, et cetera, if we're writing a CMS, 
<laughs> I mean, back to the example from you know, this morning, right? And we need to have this rich content. One way to display it is to use Markdown. Awesome, because it doesn't have any scripts, you know, all good. Well, how do we display a Markdown in an application? Like if React out of the box doesn't have a feature to display Markdown. So you will use a library that will convert your Markdown into HTML, and then you need to display it on the page. Uh, one example is the Showdown library and what it does, you know, converts to HTML. And then to display it, how we display HTML? You have to use the dangerously set inner HTML. But we're good, right, because we're using Markdown. So we should be safe. Except, what if your Markdown contains a, um, a script tag? The problem here is that the Showdown library, or whatever kind of else you're using, is not gonna strip out XSS, it's not gonna strip out HTML scripts or HTML tags before it converts it into HTML. It's just gonna take it as they were in the source and put it you know, into, into the output. So that is even more dangerous because you look at the code and you think, wow, they're using Markdown. Good, right? It gives you that sense of security. But actually, if you don't validate your Markdown coming in and it contains a script tag, an image tag, or whatever, it's gonna end up in the output as well. So again, let's look. And the solution, uh, where am I clicker today? It's not clicking back. Solution, use DOM HTML Purify. Thanks, Mario. <laughs> because again, Markdown by itself will not do that for you. So let's, let's look at the demo. So here I have my little application where I'm typing some Markdown. All good, but if I'm trying to embed an, an HTML tag, done, right. So let's look at the source code because that's more interesting than just seeing a pop-up. So here's what's going on on the client side, right? So we're getting this markdown from the server, we saved it on the server, didn't do any validation, because we know it's markdown, kinda. Uh, we convert it into HTML, and then we return it as an object with the HTML attribute, and then later in the code, we set it into the dangerously set inner HTML. And so if our markdown contains some um, XSS, it's gonna be right out there. So to fix that, we just, Use a sanitizer, for example, the DOM Purify. And if I can find the right build here. But basically, you know, it, it fixes the issue. Right. So don't think that if you're using Markdown, it's gonna save your world. Right, so if you're using pure Markdown, right, it doesn't have a way, the, 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 um, the language itself, right, doesn't have a way to input a script. But the problem, it's not kind of the problem with the Markdown standard, the Markdown itself, but with the Showdown library, or like some other libraries as well, that when it converts Markdown into HTML, if you have script tags or you know, image tags or any HTML tags, it doesn't say, oh, this doesn't look like Markdown, just kind of remove it or show an error or something. You know, it already, it already has the tag, so I'm just gonna take it and put it into the output. Because the Markdown, this converter from Markdown to HTML is not the HTML purifier, which is dumb, I think. <laughs> Yes. Well, but I really, I mean, I would say, why would you have an untrusted markdown? 
if you are saying your user can write markdown and you're storing markdown into the database, why don't you do the little check right there? Is it actually markdown or does it have your you know, angle brackets, et cetera? But for that, you basically need like a markdown purifier. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't know. Yes? And go. Okay. And Mario, you had. Thank you, thank you for the addition. So basically, Markdown is not a security, a secure subset of HTML, right? Markdown is just a subset of a cert certain features of HTML, and we shouldn't trust it, uh, we shouldn't use it as a security feature, right? So it's just a subset of HTML. And if you inject into it, you're gonna have the injection, because it doesn't do anything to prevent you from that. And is, and is that in Go, you're saying? Common mark. JS. I mean, if. So, so. You, Well, we've, unless your, your server side is written in JavaScript, then you can use a JavaScript library on the server side. But yeah, yes, yes, you, you, you can validate it on the server side when you're, before you store it in the database, right? Or, I mean, you can use the DOM purifier on the client side before you output it to the page. After you got the uh, data from the server, then you clean it, and then you put it out. And that's fine as well. If, if your client is not a browser, then, I mean, that's a different story, right? Yes. It, it's, it's a longer conversation. <laughs> Let's get to the slides. So, server-side rendering. So that's another feature that React implemented and that kind of made this framework different from others. So, what's going on here? Well, because our client is becoming heavier and heavier, the initial load of the page was taking longer and longer. That's one thing, so performance was an issue. So then React developers said, well, hey, the initial page that we show to the users doesn't, doesn't have to have any events attached to it or any interactivity first when the user just starts looking at it, right? We can add the events and the interactivity in the next few seconds, but that will have the um, uh, perception of the page loading very, very fast. So performance um, is, was one concern. And then the other problem with React and you know, other JavaScript frameworks is the search engine optimizations becomes more complex. I mean, there are ways around it, but out of the box, the SEO is not as great. So we kind of decided to switch the architecture, right? So in this case, we are rendering the HTML, the code on the server side and then, or HTML and, and JavaScript, right? And then sending the HTML that needs to be just displayed in the browser right away, and then we attach the events later. So that actually becomes very similar to the old server-side templates, to your GSPs, Smarty, whatever, right? Where you render that on the server-side and then send the HTML to the, to the browser. So kind of, the idea is not new. It's new for the JavaScript client-side, but it, it's not new in programming in general. 
And what does it change in terms of security? Well, in terms of security, oh, actually, before we get to security, so server side, right? So what, what happens is that we are rendering the HTML on the server, and then we're sending it to the client side, and we start displaying it right away. And as we're displaying the page, we're loading the JavaScript, and then we're executing React, having all the linkages, all the bindings, all the events, and then the page becomes interactive at the end. With the client side rendering, the difference is that you know, we create HTML, then we send it HTML with all the JavaScript dependencies to the browser, so then the browser takes time to load HTML, then to load all the JavaScript libraries, then to render everything with React, and only then we display it. So that kind of adds a second, two seconds, and that's a lot of time in, kinda in our world for JavaScript applications. So what does it change in terms of security? Well, one is now if you have untrusted data in your HTML template, when you're rendering it on the server side, if you're injecting something into it, you're injecting that on the server side before all your React protections, before they are enabled. So you may still be able to have an kind of plain server side injection as you had before in any other server side template. And then the other thing is that the data is added directly to the DOM, you know, without the the, it, the React bells and whistles. So let's look at an example. It will make kind of more, more sense here. So server side rendering. So we create the React elements, create the React application, we render it on the, on the server side, send the HTML, but to make the HTML alive, we need to send the state. And to send the state the way we do it, you know, and state will be just your JSON object with all the props or whatever data you need to send. And to send it the way we do it, is we set a global variable to the window. It's usually called the preloaded state or app initial state or state, just kind of all the different names, whatever. And we just set it to that JSON object right there. So that happens before React is loaded. So, all right, what if I have user input into that JSON object? Well, if I'm trying to inject um, something into JSON, like I would say, I would like to inject um, JavaScript, so I need to break out of the JSON context. So I try to inject double quotes, it gets escaped, you know, it doesn't work. But if I inject something like that, I mean, from the JavaScript perspective, I'm still good, I'm still in double quotes, I didn't break out of my JSON object, but the way the server, the, the browser is gonna render it, it's gonna pick up the first script tag, and then it's gonna pick up the second, the closing script tag and say, that's it, the script is done, and then it's gonna render my alert as the next script. This is just the quirkiness of browsers, kinda of this is how it works, and there you have your injection. Which is funny because you are injecting into JavaScript content, uh, context, so you shouldn't need a script tag, right? We always say like, oh, the injection is, according to the context, we should just in inject the JavaScript. But that's actually how it works with the browser. So, and the problem, the biggest problem with that is this code example uh, on top here without any protection is in any tutorial on React. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's a, well, but the, but but that's the browser, so that, I mean, that's how it interprets the JavaScript, right? It's, uh, I mean, not the JavaScript, so the, 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 the HTML. Yeah, 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 right. So yeah, <laughs> thank you, Deb. So, um, the browser parses the HTML first and says, okay, opening script, closing script, opening script, closing script. It doesn't know that the double quote, like this is still the JSON object that I'm trying to create inside the JavaScript, so. Yep, the embedded context get very, very messy. So let's look at an example here. Oh, I'm already in the, the 
mode. So okay. Oh, come on. Demo gods. I have a complex password. It's not one to three. So, so here is my application that renders on the server side. And if I'm sending a, you know, just a URL parameter, it renders on the page, all good. But if I'm sending a script, as I showed you, right, I get an XSS, nothing interesting. So let's look at the source code here. Well, first at the page source. So the interesting thing is that the injection happens not in the React code, right? That injection of the state, where we say window, you know, app initial state, this is before the React app. The, so this is just kind of pure old HTML with some JavaScript. Yep. Sorry. Uh, there is no templating language. So. Oh, um, the, I mean, you may be using a templating language like EGS, J, I mean, depending on what your server side is written in, right? If it's node code, you will use EGS, Jade, whatever. <laughs> Nothing standard. I mean, if you're using, writing this in Java, you will just, you just be like, whatever. It doesn't matter, right? Um, so if we look at the location where this information, so the injection is, You can, you can see the, the pointer. But yeah, so the, the injection is right here, right? If we're looking how the React interprets that payload, I mean, it actually does all the encoding. So it's not, it's kind of like, it's not the React's problem, really, <laughs> right? So React says like, oh, well, I did my encoding, I, I didn't do anything. So once that is inside the React template, it's all encoded. But the problem is that we inject the state before the React app. The state is, you know, and the React app needs the state bef when it loads. So, so it should already be in the HTML page. So if we look at the code here. Right. So we, we are creating our state here. And I'm taking my, you know, so the, I have the um, JavaScript server-side code, Express, kind of nothing fancy. So I get my name from the query parameter, don't do any sanitization, create my state, send the couple parameters into it, and then I call this render to string. So this is the React uh, function that renders the React DOM on the server side, renders it to, string, to, to a string, and then I'm using a template and passing that into the um, initial state parameter that is then injected into the index page right here on the client side. Oh, sorry. The template. No, template here. Right, so I, then I take that initial state and set it to a global app initial state variable. So how do we fix it? Well, let's look. Oh, before, before we get to the, to the fixing uh, question. The other thing is, so that was the server-side rendering without any um, state management on React, right? We just have our state in the JavaScript. Well, what if you're using Redux? Same problem, right? Same thing. If you're using Redux, you still have to set the state initially. Um, and like all you do is you do the JSON stringify. And you, know, you do it in the previous example as well, just kind of earlier in the code. And again, the problem with the, with the React uh, uh, with the Redux was that this code, this vulnerable code, was in their documentation. Like that's like if you go look for how to create, you know, do SSR with Redux, like that's the code you're gonna get until like what 2015, I think. Um, Emily Smith found this vulnerability, you know, reported it to Redux, and because it's not an issue in the Redux, it's just kind of the issue in their documentation. Now they have, on this page, they have on the bottom a little section that says security concerns and says, by the way, 
if you're doing it right away, you're gonna have a problem, and this is how you fix it. So instead, just use, you know, dot replace, and you, you know, escape any um, less than character, whatever. So that's kind of it. That's the fix that they are proposing. Of course, I would say a better fix would be to use a library that will just serialize JavaScript. So for example, you know, the serialized JavaScript library will basically encode your scripts into JavaScript context, and that will fix the issue. So, uh, the next, oh, we're running out of time. Ooh, all right, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up. Uh, so the next vulnerability is, again, eval. <laughs> How many eval problems can we have? Well, as long as we have eval in JavaScript, there are gonna be issues with that. Again, this is not React specific, actually, but like we, we see that. So going back to the serialized JavaScript library that I just said, use it, it's awesome. Well, what it does, it serializes JavaScript. And if you serialize something, you may wanna deserialize something. Well, the serialized JavaScript library doesn't have the deserialize function in it. And instead, what they have is they have this wonderful piece of code in their documentation on their readme page on GitHub saying that, hey, if you wanna deserialize something that you serialize, do it like this. Just put it in the parentheses and call eval on that. What can go wrong? And I think they didn't include this function into the library just so that they didn't have to fix it. <laughs> Nobody could, could say, hey, you guys have an issue. And, and the problem is, I mean, there is no way to fix it. That's the issue. It's not like we have a function that's called safe eval that's not gonna evaluate your JavaScript in there, right? I mean, if you are using something like that, it's, it's probably a design issue and you have to like redesign your application the way you're using it. Or again, you're validating your input first and you know that whatever I'm sending to the eval is super, super safe, but you know, who's gonna say that? <laughs> Who wants to lose their job? Um, Another new location for using eval that I saw, so this was on Stack Overflow, so um, the question was on Stack Overflow, well, I wanna send some JSX to my application from the server side to the client side and then the render the JSX and like update my React app on the fly on the client side, how do I do that? And that was the recommendation, you know, use Babel, convert it, and then do the transformation and then just eval the code that Babel converted. Right, What's, what does this code do? Well, first of all, if you're using Babel on the client side, that's already a big problem because Babel is super heavy. <laughs> that's not helping your performance. And second, now you're evaluated code that you know, I don't know where it's coming from and what your JSX may contain. And then of course we still have the, G, the parsing of JSON with eval less, much, much, much less so uh, because of course finally developers started using json.parse and not do just eval, but that sometimes happen, happens in the uh, legacy applications. And another problem with eval is that it will not let you create a strong CSP, because if you're using eval or your library is using eval, you have to say unsafe eval, and you know, it's kind of like you're breaking all the protection again that you just implemented with CSP. So React can communicate, you know, communicates with the server. The functions are slightly different, you know, it's using the new fetch, well, not not React, but developers, right? Us usually use a new fetch function that by default makes a get request. And funny enough, the uh, code that we have seen, sometimes developers use the fetch function, um, the, the get request to change state on the server. Because it's simple, right? Unfortunately, that happens. Uh, and this is kind of the API, and it's like, oh, it's just gonna be a get, and then the API is actually, you know, change user profile with the get request problems come out of here, so you should use the post request, you should have the request authenticated. By default, the fetch, if you set it to a post request, uh, will not include the cookies, so you have to set the set, um, credentials parameter, and you either set it to same origin or um, include. If you wanna, if you are using sys, um, course, that's when you're gonna use the include, right? Then, then you're gonna send your cookies to, across the origins, but by default, if you're not using course, you would set it to same origin. Or if you're using, don't use tokens, you're using JWTs or whatever other um, tokens in the headers, you would set, a, set an authentication, uh, authorization header in uh, the headers with, with the fetch function. 
And then the next problem is leaking sensitive data into the client side. You know, talked about that a lot of times. The reason why this comes up in React. So this is, again, a bigger topic. I'm just going to mention it. But because React doesn't implement CSRF protection, the kind of the client side part of getting the CSRF token and then adding a CSRF header or something, um, developers still need to solve this problem. And one of the solutions that everybody says, like, well, just use JWTs, JSON Web Tokens. Then you're not using cookies. Then you don't have CSRF. Wrong. <laughs> JWTs are not meant to maintain sessions. They have a bunch of other problems. I mean, I'm not saying they're, they're bad. They just have a different use case. And then also you should implement them correctly, sign them, have the right expiration times, et cetera, et cetera. So, but oftentimes the React applications are using them, and where do they store them? They will store them in local storage. You cannot tell them to store it in session storage because, okay, this is a single page app. It shouldn't have a page refresh or an other tab, but nobody's code is perfect, and page, you know, application will still use a refresh, and then your session storage is gone. I mean, you cannot make your user log in every time they open the app in the new tab, right? So you're gonna end up using local storage. So from the pen testers perspective, your payload now is not gonna be, you know, script alert, but it's gonna be something like that, right? You're gonna say, hey, local storage dot get item, you know, JWT token or OAuth token. So we're now looking not at the cookies, not document.cookie, but at whatever is stored in the local storage. Solution, don't store anything sensitive in local storage, but if you are using JWTs, make sure the duration is not long, you're refreshing them. Again, that's a separate topic. It's, it's, um, it's a design issue, right? It's not something we can fix with just line of code. So do's and don'ts, if you're using React, kind of to sum it up, don't use eval, don't use dangerously set inner HTML. If you are using it, use DOM purify, you know, very validate your HTML before you're setting it to the page. Um, don't use valid, you know, don't use untrusted input when you're creating the URLs, when you're setting the href or form action or something like that. Don't create components dynamically. If you do, validate whatever you're putting into the props. You know, make sure you cannot, user cannot inject the dangerous set HTML into the props. And don't store sensitive information in local storage. Do's, perform JavaScript encoding if you're using SSR, right? So, but that state should be serialized first before you set it to the global variable in, the, in JavaScript. Use authentication on your post requests with fetch. Um, and do use types. I mean, in React, you can use the prop types that will make your code cleaner, a little bit more secure for the properties at least. And you can also use the ESLint plugin for React that has a bunch of rules, mostly quality rules, because ESLint is not a you know, security tool. But there are a couple of rules that actually will identify low-hanging fruit or at least um, show you points of interest where you can kind of look into the code, investigate, is everything right? So here's a subset of the ESLint properties. It allows you to find everywhere where you said like the dangerous to set HTML, it's the no danger rule, or um, DOM elements with no children. So if you have a DOM element like a uh, image that shouldn't have a child, right, and you are setting children to it, probably something is wrong with the code, kind of we should investigate that. That's again on the security review standpoint, like what, what we will be looking at in the React applications. Um, and a set of rules, so the forbid DOM props allows you to configure any DOM property. If you're setting it in React, it will flag it. So I would always um, configure something like that, href form action, you know, if, if we're setting something with that, with href, it's probably an interesting place to look at. And that's it. So any questions? Oh, why we don't restore sensitive data in local storage? Because if you have XSS, done. Well, so, but, well, look, actually, that's one thing. But another thing is that it is there, I, I guess I did mention that, if you are storing something in local storage, you should clear it out when you log out of the application, right? So that when you close the application, it's not there anymore. So Other the, the, the time, the, the, it, you should expire them, yes. Um, 
Right. So, so there, there are multiple things, right? You would set the, the duration of the session shorter, or you would clear it on logout. Uh, but there are other things that you may store in local storage, like a, you know, um, a refresh, well, you can have a refresher token that has a much longer life, right? So for things like that. But, yeah, but, but in XSS, it's still another issue. Like if you're still on the page, you can read it. Yeah, right. Yes, the, qu the question was um, why while storing something in the local storage, well, not, not something, but specifically a session identifier is a in the local storage is a problem, right? So one is that, you know, if when you close the application, it is still there, and then the question is how long is your session duration, right? How long this ID will be good, st still good for, for how long if it's, you know, stolen later. So you can mitigate it both ways, right? You can, you can just set the duration of the session much shorter, but then if you are having like a refresh token that will have a longer life, and you store that there. So from kind of the way, the, what we recommend is we still recommend using cookies and HTTP only for, for to, to prevent that. But yes, then you will have to use the CSRF tokens to prevent CSRF, so. It's not a, you know, one size fits all solution, obviously. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs>